um, oh, I've just been told that we're right. recording. Excellent. No, That's okay. <laughs> I'll be mindful of what I say now. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I can right. I can have a tendency to swear a little bit, but that's the Australian coming out of me. So I suppose just a little bit of my background. Um, I am a, re a now retired international hockey umpire. Um, I've actually worked with a lot of the New Zealand umpires and Karen Bennett, who's um, based on the South Island, just out of Christchurch, is actually one of my very best friends. Um, Kelly Hudson, who's on the North Island, Amber Church, who's on the North Island, um, have just actually recently come back from the Olympics. So um, as much as we are on separate separate spaces we're, we're very close I um started my international hockey career at quite a young age in fact I was probably in my mid-20s and then progressed up the ranks really quickly actually in two when was it I'm just trying to process because my timelines but in um 2003 I was identified in the top 10 up and coming women in the world um, and was invited to a federation of international hockey space where we all got together and, and had some discussions about how the sport was progressing and as officials and as young officials how we were moving through and then I fell pregnant the next year <laughs> and had my first child so I had some time out after having Harper and actually stepped back from my international officiating space kept active nationally but I kind of stepped back and then in 2007 had my second um, my little girl and then Probably in around 2010, I fought my way back into the top 20 officials in the world. And I was the first first female to do that in, um, in a really long time and the oldest female to do that in a really long time as well. So um, kind of progressed, did some top level tournaments around the world, um, missed out on the Olympics, Rio. And at that point decided that it was time for me to step back and retire from on-field umpiring and have since stepped into the umpires managing and umpires coaching phase um fih recognize me now we have three tiers the top three the, the the top tier tier three being olympics there are only two um officials who actually meet that criteria in the world and i'm sitting at tier two so my goal one day will to be will be to be at um, either the Commonwealth Games or the Olympics. I'm already doing some top level tournaments when they come back, because at the moment, nothing's happening around the world um, and, and coaching umpires as they progress on their career path where I once was. So I suppose that's a little bit of my background. Other than that, I'm a mum of two teenagers. So conflict is a normal part of my day every day. Um, and I also am a teacher by trade, but currently work for the Queensland Teachers Union as an industrial officer. So I suppose conflict and conflict resolution is my bread and butter on a daily basis. Um, and that's why I'm passionate about it. And I now am um, working with a group called the Officiating Collective. And Blake, I know um, Tennis New Zealand have just signed a memorandum of understanding with the Officiating Collective. And I'd strongly recommend if you Google search the Officiating Collective, get on there and join because the people that you will have access to and the resources that you will have access to are second to none. Um, people like myself, Simon Tofel, um, Donna Kelso, uh, most of you would have heard of Donna. Um, we, we are involved in this space and um, I look at the, the resources that are being produced and think, oh my God, I wish I'd had access to this, this stuff during my journey. So really quick background. Blake, back to you. Love it. And I think uh, for all of our tennis people, I have only just signed that yet and I haven't, uh, we haven't announced that to the oh. world yet. It will be <laughs> Uh, not, not, that, not that it's secret at all. Not that it's secret, <laughs> but uh, we will come out to everyone. And I think uh, our racket sports people as well, I'm going to be pushing that out to, awesome. to come to your organisations as well because uh, I got led into it last night when I pulled out uh, Lynn's things that I sent through for pre-reading and it's phenomenal. Um, and I didn't even consider myself an official as, as it were, but all the information in there is, is phenomenal. So we will progress through that for sure. Um, it's a world exclusive, Blake. There we go. There Friday go. night world exclusive. I love it. <laughs> Breaking news. Excellent. There we go. Fantastic. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think the for tennis people, the, the reason we kind of wanted to come to Lynn was a, around the development of everyone and, and wanting everyone to get more comfortable in our conflict and how we handle that. Um, there's tournament directors and there's uh, officials on the line. So I think officials have to deal with stuff on court and tournament people have to uh, deal with things off court so the conflict I'm going to get is different to what officials are going to get but I think we can have the same kind of skills as we kind of progress so um I hope, knowing everyone's probably done that that reading already thank you for sending that through Lynn um can can you start with just a story or, or some thoughts around how we how as officials or 
if someone's going to come to me at the tournament desk, they're already in a state of kind of ready for conflict or they're upset or there's something that's happened that's yep. upset them. Yep. Um, so we're already on the back foot almost and we have yeah. to kind of assess really quickly. So, yeah, just talk yeah. us through some skills. Or- and I suppose... Um- it is it's, it is learning to assess and read people. So if someone's coming to you at the desk, and I've actually spoken, um, I don't know if Scott's on the line, but I've spoken a little bit. I've worked, I do some work with Tennis Australia, with, with the officials at Tennis Australia. And um, so it's a unique situation for me when, you know, you're sitting at a desk, I suppose, and so people can just come to the desk and they're in your face. And, and I've seen some, um, some videos where you've got this desk and it's actually in a lower position. And so people are actually standing over the top. Of officials. So the first thing that I spoke to Tennis Australia about was repositioning the desk so that the officials behind the desk have positions of power. So I'm not sure what happens in New Zealand or happens around your local, in your local spaces, but think about where you position your desk. So the straight, the first thing is if, if your desk is backed into a corner, as a person who may be heightened or upset, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come over and I'm going to back you back into that corner. So I'm going to own the power and I'm going to own that space. And it puts you in a position of submission straight away. So I've just said, think about where you put your desk. Think about putting it out into the open. Put it fit. Put it somewhere where you think. I actually even suggested put it up a little bit on a on a podium. I know that sounds really, really daggy, but if you've got the ability to do that, Absolutely do that because what it will allow you to do is then look down at somebody and that automatically puts them in a lesser position and it actually teaches them to back off. So I think, think about where your table is and think about also the other, the other, I saw so many videos which really surprised me in tennis of people allowing people to stand over the top of them. That absolutely removes your power and removes your ability ability to, I suppose, resolve the conflict that could be occurring. So the first thing that I will always do is if somebody stands over the top of me or tries to lean in over the top of me, I actually stand up and create an equal eye level straight away because that creates equality in the situation. It creates a sense of, well, hang on, we're equals here. I think the other thing you've got to assess is, is the person so heightened that no matter what you say at that point, it's there's not going to be a resolution, right? It's just not going to work. Um, or if they're a reasonable person and they want to have a genuine con- you know, conversation with you and, ha- and, and look at how you're going to resolve some of that stuff. So I'm going to give you an example of something that I experienced at a tournament. I was at a desk in an office um, and it was quite a large space. And um, a fellow came in and it, it was like this big drama scene. So he flung open the door and said, who's the umpire's manager? Because I need to speak to them now. And like dead set, that's how he spoke. And I was at my laptop and I just said, I, and I didn't, I didn't make eye contact. I kept doing my work and I said, that would be me. I said, take a seat and I'll get to you when I finish this job. I wasn't doing a job. I just kept typing and I had my little clock up so I could see how long I was making him wait. And he went and sat down and I made him wait for five minutes. That's a really long time if you time five minutes on a clock. So by the time I got to him, he'd had the time to sit down, take a breath, rah, you know, like all of that had come down. And the first thing I did was I removed the table between us. I got up and I went and sat opposite him at the same eye line and said, how can I help? Now that question's really, really important because when I say to someone, how can I help? it actually makes them take a breath and go, oh, what? She's offering to help me. If I'd gone over in there and said, what's your problem? What's the issue? Yeah. What's someone done? Why? Think about your language. So how can I help you? And, and the first thing he said was, oh, down on, and this is a hockey situation, right? So we have it in hockey, the ball, if anyone's watched the Olympics recently, the ball can actually come up off the surface and we assess for, danger now so the only time that we're blowing a whistle in relation to a ball off the turf is if there's danger it creates a dangerous situation and he was from the old school and in the olden days he couldn't put the ball up off the turf right but he didn't know that he didn't know the new interpretation didn't know the new rule and so one of the first he said oh the ball down on field two was raised and the umpires just weren't even calling it and I said well that's really interesting I said because we don't assess raise anymore we assessed 
danger. And I went through the rule with him and talked about legitimate evasive action and the intent and the purpose. And I said, so you know what? I said, I'm going to talk to the umpires coaches who were down on that game. And once I've done that, I'm going to come and find you. Can you actually give me your mobile number? And I'll have a debrief with you to assess that. I said, but it's really important that if you look at rule 2.9.1, this is really important, guys. You need to know your rules and you need to know your stuff. Because if you don't, you are on the back foot from the start. I could quote the rule and I actually always, I know it sounds daggy, I'm old school. I always have a paper copy of it and I'll dead set show you, I'll show you my phone too. Um, on my phone, where is my FIH? I don't know if you can see it, but oh, it's a bit blurry. I have my FIH rule book on my phone as well. So I can refer to this all the time. It's like my Bible. So I can refer. So I showed him the rule. I actually had the paper copy there. And I said, you know, no worries. I'll get back to you. And so he gave me his mobile phone number. And I went and spoke to the umpire's coach. And as, as my gut told me, right, um, the umpires had been assessing that correctly. It was his misinterpretation of that rule. So I rang him. I went and found him at the ground. I had the conversation. I photocopied the rule for him and said, if you see me out and about wandering around and you want to come and sit with me while I coach some of my umpires, I'm happy to sit with you and teach you that rule. He didn't come and sit with me. But straight away, by not addressing him straight away when he was heightened, by making him sit and wait, and I then determined when I was speaking to him, by asking him the kinder question, how can I help you? And then inquiring about some of his interpretation, giving him a timeline. I'm going to follow up with my umpire's coaches and then I'm going to get back to you. And I did. And then I afforded him the opportunity to learn more. Now, I know we all don't have time to do that when we've got, you know, 20 courts running and there's two of us there. But that was at a tournament where we were running 25 fields of hockey at once so it was it was high level and I was there coordinating the entire tournament doing umpire allocations and ensuring that I had umpires coaches at at least not all the games but some of the games so you go through stages and that's learnt does anyone have any questions about that or clarification Blake in New Zealand where do you sit your tables yeah interesting you said that actually um I personally, I put it in a very public area. Mm -hmm. um, we do have kind of tournament offices around the country in some yep. venues. I refuse to use them. I don't <laughs> like being in a room or someone coming to a door or something that I can put in front of it. Yep. Um, and I, ha I have found that it's immediately kind of disarmed everyone. I'm, yep. I'm very approachable. People can come to the desk. That's not a problem. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely know from my own experiences that the standing up and kind of leveling that out that I feel, I think that's definitely true. And I find the reverse of that as well, because uh, I work a lot with junior tournaments. So I'll be talking down to the child if I'm standing yeah. up. So I'll sit down. Get so down. That, yeah. yeah. Um, and I was just yeah. thinking that too. So for, for your example there, you know, giving an adult some time to calm down and, and kind of having an adult conversation with yeah. them how does that work or how does that look if kind of for tennis we're called to a court and we have a very emotional player or there's yeah. kind of something happening on court how do we yeah. inject ourselves into that so i think it's i've actually seen some clips and i'm going to refer to some hockey um, from tennis australia stuff so i've seen two and it's it, it was a lot of these were victorian examples for those of you who know australia victoria is like southern and and, and we always have a joke because we reckon all the crazy stuff happens in victoria in any sport right but victorian officials actually now wear body cams so so they film interactions with parents, grandparents, kids, coaches. And it's actually been a really good tool. And um, I work with Martin from Tennis Australia who sent me all of these clips. And what really surprised me, Blake, and, and I suppose I'll share with this, a lot of the aggression towards officials that I witnessed through, through their body cams were predominantly young men or male parents being aggressive towards female officials and I found that really really interesting because it was almost like they had a perception that they had a right 
to behave that way. And I think the other thing, and I, so I am going to come back to your question about on-court stuff, but I think the other thing is we need to be mindful of what our young players, especially our young players who have been competitive on a court, are seeing. I Googled, before I worked with Tennis Australia, I just Googled um, um, tennis moments. Like I, I put that into my phone, tennis moments. And what popped up was every tennis player possible behaving badly. So, so um, they, they had clips from, you know, McEnroe through to Williams, through to like there were just people and the behaviour was absolutely abhorrent. If young players are Googling tennis moments and the first thing that they see are highly competitive players behaving really poorly towards officials, then that is a message to them that they're allowed to do it. Okay, they did show you as part of those clips how officials were managing that space, but what they showed was highly emotive, volatile situations. So, so young players who are heavily influenced by social media, whether we like it or not, it's the, it's the reality of the world. I've got a 14 year old and a 16 year old, right? They're influenced by social media. Um, hence the reason I can cut their time at home and I regularly do, and you'll hear them. I won't do it tonight. They're actually, my son's at work and my daughter's gone out to youth group, but you'll hear this, mum. <laughs> say no and I've turned the internet off but they're heavily influenced by behaviors of people online so when they're out on the court and they're competitive we, we have to assess where we're kind of at so like what age bracket are we working with and the teacher and me goes the, probably the one of the worst age brackets is around our 14 year old 14 year olds like I don't know if any of you are teachers but that's year nine in Australia and we have a saying that year nines are animals because they are absolutely foul and my daughter is 14 and I can assure you I'm very quickly remembering why we say that they are foul because they're disgusting so the, the behaviors because of at that particular stage in their development are heightened and hormones are going on so they're going to heighten even more quickly and the other thing that will agitate this is when parents or grandparents are heckling from behind the fence. And, and I've seen this, and this isn't just unique to tennis or our other sports involved tonight. This is unique to, I think, every sport. I reckon if they could create a one-way glass window that parents sat behind and that was soundproof, that would be beneficial for all children's sport because then the kids would more than likely just get on with the game and we wouldn't have half the problems that we have, right, because parents exacerbate it. Um, so that being said, you go out, you, you wander over, you have not seen what's happened, right? But you walk out and you've got these two kids going, it was out. No, it wasn't. I said it was there. All right. And that's, you know, it's this, 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 tit, tat, tit, tat. The first thing that I would observe is who's around the space and who's antagonizing. So um, one clip from Tennis Australia, there was this mum, this poor official's walking onto the court and she's like, that kid in the black hat's lying. That ball wasn't out. My child's right. And he's been it. And I'm like, holy Jesus. Like it was full on. It was mum. Anyway, what the official actually did was she, she got out. She managed it reasonably well. I would have done things a bit differently. But she allowed mum to stay in earshot. So the first thing that, because the kids were together at one end of the court, like the kid had come down. So they were one end of the court. And so she was trying to address it with these two young children with mum going in the background. The first thing I would have said to mum as she walked through, I would have cut her, like she, we allowed this conversation to go. I would have gone, got it, thanks. Put my hand up, like, I know, got it, thanks. Think about your tone. Got it, thanks. That would have upset her even more. Got it, thanks. And then I would have walked down to the kids in the, onto the court. And the first thing I would have done is move those two children to the other end of the court, away from mum who's net, 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 and heightening the behaviour. So be mindful of the positioning of where you're going to talk to young people because if their parents or others are around, it's going to exacerbate. Remove them. It, 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 it kind of takes them down. Also, walking them when you're there calms. When kids, move, when kids are still, they're like this, especially if they've been moving and playing. So how do we calm them down? We make them just walk slowly, take a few breaths. I'm really clear, and I know that the code of conduct kind of goes through this, Blake, and you can work, you know, you're the expert, I am not in this space. But I would be very clear and explicit about how things are going to roll with those two kids. So when I get down, I would say, look, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to ask you what you saw, and you're going to be respectful and listen. Then I'm going to ask you what you saw and you are going to be respectful and listen. 
And based what you, on what you tell me, I'm then going to make a decision based on the rules of the sport or the code of conduct. You quote what you need to quote, right? You let them. If anyone tries to interrupt, you go, uh, uh, uh. We're showing respect. We're showing respect to our colleague. So we are modeling the behavior that we want them to exhibit. We are calm. We are modeling that you listen and then I'm going to get, you're going to have your turn. That's okay. My hand movements are really calming. I'm not doing this because a 14 year old boy will just go, right, let's go. Okay. So I'm like, it's okay. It's good. And we, and then you make your decision. Now you might not get that right. That's okay. We're not, we're human and we didn't see it. But the fact that they both feel that they've been heard is actually a really powerful statement. And they will accept in a majority of situations, they mightn't like it, but they will accept that they've been heard and a decision has been made based on the rules of the game. And we need to model that to our young people. We really do. Because what I see occurring more and more in society, and maybe I'm just becoming a cranky middle-aged white woman, I don't know, but I'm seeing young people's behaviours really heighten. But then I look at the fact that a lot of the time the behaviours are not addressed. It's like a two-year-old. You know, when, <laughs> when I'm walking through Coles and I see a two-year-old drop to the ground because they want that lollipop and mum or daddy's saying no. And you give them that look of, I feel your pain because I have been there, right? I actually admire the parent that says, you're not getting it because they are teaching a child straight away that when you tantrum like that, you are not going to be rewarded for that behavior. In actual fact, we are going to punish you in a way. It, 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 and as a two-year-old, if I tantrum and got a lollipop, guess what I'd be doing every time I went to Coles? I'd be tantruming and getting a lollipop every time I went. It's the same with kids in sport. If they behave badly and we do not manage that behavior appropriately, they will continue to behave that way. It is our responsibility as officials to give them a life skill, I believe, because I think sport teaches people life skills. Give them a life skill. You're not always going to get what you want, but I will treat you with respect while we are going through the process. You are modeling what we want good humans good citizens to do in everyday life. And we can establish that in sport. So look at the people who are heightening, remove. That allows them to calm and take a breath, go through the procedure that's going to happen and then make your decision and you stick to it. Then you can, when you leave the court and they get on with whoever's, you know, taking serve next or whatever is happening, is happening. Maybe just hang for a little while. Don't go and stand next to mum who's having a go. Go stand on the other side, but hang for a little while. And then move away because that also indicates to those two, I trust you. I trust that you are going to get on with this game. Um, and I think that's, that's really powerful. But like, I think the other part of this too is I don't know if you keep data um, around your players, but, you know, um, in, with, with a lot of um, tournaments, uh, in hockey at least, we have cards that we can give. You know, so like if, if a player gets a certain amount of green, yellow or red cards, they might have to sit out for a match for example, okay? So what you can do, what I would be doing in, in tennis is if you know that there is a particular player that for the last six weeks in a row, an official has had to go down because there has been an alleged breach or conflict or whatnot, I'd be ensuring that that person's game, you, there's an official on it right from the get-go so that they know that they're being monitored and that just diffuses things right from the start. And that it, it sends a message to everyone as well. If you behave badly, you are being watched <laughs> and we will manage you accordingly. So it's just think about some of the processes you can put in place to prevent the conflict from happening before it even occurs. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right there, Lynn. And I think my main takeaway from all of that is around language and positioning as well. So we do have to be calm when we approach those situations, because I'm sure it's very easy to, to kind of come in over the top and, and demand that they listen or be really, uh, yeah, show your authority on the spot and demand yeah. that, that this is what's happening from here. And it doesn't need to be that way necessarily. You can work it with them. Um, 
because I do think, it, particularly in tennis, our our bad outcome is that there will always be one upset person from each scenario, and trying Absolutely. to yeah. And, and do you have any, any skills for that as well? How do well, we deal with? I, I mean, like, but it, it's as we said, one person is not going to like your decision. I, I remember doing a workshop with Simon Torfell. So Simon Torfell um, was one of. Well, I still consider him the best cricket umpire in the world and he, he's an Australian fellow. He said, just make the decision because you're going to be criticised anyway. And I really liked that thought process because that's the reality of it as an official. No matter what you do, someone's not going to be happy with the decision. And you just need to accept that that's okay. It's part of our sport. But the way that we manage it to earn the respect or at least the tolerance of the players is how we conduct ourselves. And I suppose that comes a bit back to recognising how we communicate. And that was in some of the reading that I sent um, over to Blake that I know he shared, is recognising who you are as a communicator, what you feel comfortable with, and also your lived experience. And I think you're recognizing that lived experience so that you can put some boundaries around yourself. It's really, really important. So um, for example, I come from a family where um, I, ha I have some trauma background. So like my, my dad was quite um, aggressive and abusive. So when a, a full grown male comes at me, I know I have a physical reaction to that because I have a fearful reaction to that and I've had to teach myself skills to manage that because I can tell you right now in international hockey when people are competing to go into a gold medal match the coaches do not hold back right so I've had people come at me and I've had at my local division one hockey tournament where a team lost a drunken supporter actually physically grabbed me after the game and pushed me against a wall you know, now that that's assault, right? Um, and that was managed accordingly because somebody reported that to the police. But the, the, the reality of the matter is understand who you are and give yourself strategies about how you're going to manage a situation. And you need to practice this. I was talking to Blake earlier in the week. This stuff does not happen overnight. It, 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 you have to practice this stuff. I, this is going to sound really daggy, but before I used to go out to an international hockey game, I would spend an hour in the mirror, like dead set, in my bathroom mirror in the morning, practicing my facial expressions, my tone, and my body language. Because if I can't see it, how, do, how am I supposed to feel it? And so I had to practice how I was going to manage myself, knowing different players that were going to come at me or coaches that were going to come at me that day. So not everyone is ever going to be happy with your decision. And in tennis, it's two players. Someone's going to not be happy and the other player is going to be very happy. But it's how we manage the situation in that decision that will determine how they then react and behave afterwards. They might not like your decision. That's okay. But they will respect it if you have followed through with a process and come to the decision based on using the skills of your game and the rules of your game. Yeah. There's no that's like not a that. simple there's no simple simple answer. <laughs> so I wish there uh, was. Yeah, I just had a question though in a, in a simple way. Mm -hmm. Uh where, like you said when you walk when and the, when you would walk on court and you you'd put your hand up to the mum and say thank you I, I you know I've got this. Yep. That's okay. What kind of words would you say to the kids to you've given them the decision you've got the yep. one happy and the one not happy uh and you need to stay or or get them yep. to commence playing again is yep. there any kind of words that way too that you can say all right guys let's let's go let's yeah continue. oh absolutely so i mean <laughs> it's i'll put my mum hat on a bit here too and i do i do like my husband will quite regularly say do not use your mum voice with me i'm your husband and i'm like well if i get the desired outcome i'll use my mum voice right so <laughs> you play the card as you need to so you know, as it's part of that explanation right from the get-go. So this is what's gonna this is what's gonna happen. I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna make my decision, and then we're gonna get on with the game. So the kids know right from the get-go, after I've made my decision, we are going to get on with the game. And if one of them chooses to throw their racket or have a tantrum or do you need to then manage that child and that behavior. And whether that is like the famous Serena Williams where she, you know, got ejected from the court because of whatever it was, then so be it. 
I'm sorry. So actually, I'm sorry, not sorry. I'm not sorry. If that child chooses to behave inappropriately and then you then have to manage that behaviour and that is the end of the game, then the message that it sends is very clear. We have gone through a process. I have shown respect. The other player has shown respect. Your behaviour is inappropriate. I am now managing your behaviour. And it also sets a tone for everybody else that's witnessing that, right? Because what they will see is, oh, the officials aren't going to tolerate that anymore and in actual fact um, if the game ends and then my child doesn't get the points then their ranking doesn't improve so I'm going to have to be really mindful of how I behave on the court and how I'm going to coach this child to behave on the court because ultimately it's going to be to their detriment if they can't control themselves so I think you have to address the behavior as it occurs you can preempt through process. This is what's going to happen. And then we're going to get on with the game. But if one child decides, I'm not going to get on with the game, manage that behavior. It's like in hockey. If I make a decision and everyone else is getting on with it bar one person who might go, you're effing kidding. Well, guess what? They're going to sit off that pitch for a good 10 to 15 minutes for swearing directly at me because it's bringing the game into disrepute. Done. And I don't, I don't shy away from that. I can tell you right now, players... And players will learn this too as they get older and they have the capability to understand. As, an, as you gain experience in this space, players will very quickly go, will quickly go, sorry, I'm just going to look for a name. Oh, Sylvia. Oh, Sylvia's on court today. We know we can't mess around with her because she will just do what needs to be done. So we're going to behave. They, they'll know and they'll play according to that. When I'm on the field with a, I, I still umpire our top division hockey in, um, in Australia and in Queensland, in Brisbane. I think it's really, really important that I practice what I preach and that I mentor our young ones coming through and support them as best I can. And it's very interesting when you listen to the players around me, right? Because what they'll say really cl clearly is, oh, Lynn's on today. So you know the tackles that you cannot make in Lynn's half. Like they know. They know that they'll make a poor tackle down my colleague's end. Now, I'll be on mic trying to support them. Okay, that's a penalty corner. Great. Did you think about a card? You know, I'll talk to them as need to be. But they know down my end, it will be a penalty corner and a yellow card. Get off. If you're going to tackle like that and injure someone, you're going to go. Players, they're, they're smart. Kids are smart. We don't give them enough credence. They know exactly what they can get away with with you and they will push your buttons and your boundaries. So unless you are stringent in what you do and you follow through and you're consistent, if I were a player, I'd manipulate that as well. And back in my day, I did. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, you do what you do. So be, manage the, manage the behaviour as it, as it occurs. And once you gain experience in this and, and you set a tone for the whole tournament, Players will very quickly know what they can and can't do, and they, and they will they will not do things. Yeah, and I I could think even just my own experiences with that around kind of my tournament desk as well. I I get that feeling. So when I set the tone for what is happening, and and hopefully everyone's a bit happy and and everything's okay when they come to the desk, that kind of flows on to what's happening out on the court, and everyone's a lot more calmer. So yeah, I do really like. Uh, all of that I think that's really cool there, there was a question as well around I know we touched on kind of the parent that came to the desk that you saw and and demanded your attention yeah our officials for tennis as soon as they've dealt with the kids they will come off the court yep. usually be greeted by a parent a coach somebody yep. um, they may not have the opportunity to say go and rest yep. you know go and yep. sit and have five minutes while yep. you yep. know to calm down um yeah, any golden words or, or skills to develop for that one? I think, yeah, look, I think there's there's two ways you can go. You need to assess, you need to assess what the intent and purpose of the conversation is. So if the conversation, if if the if the intent of of kind of bowing you up as you walk off the court is to simply have a go, then I wouldn't I wouldn't engage for a long period of time. I, I really wouldn't. But if the legitimate intent is to best understand how the decision was made, then I think you can engage in that space, but you've got to understand how and what that person's trying to achieve. In a lot of the video clips that I saw from um, Tennis Victoria, it was about power. It was not about genuinely trying to understand the decision. It was about creating a sense of power. And in fact, um, one dad said to one of the match officials, I actually don't want to speak to you. I want to speak to your superior. And like 
went like that, right? And I was like, oh my God. Oh, well, actually I won't say what I said. It wasn't very flattering. <laughs> um, but at that, at, at that point, I, I would simply say, that's fine. I'll go and find June for you or whoever it is and walk away, get out. I think the other thing that I have done um, and I give myself time, like as you're walking off a field after just having umpired 70 minutes of hockey, you're heightened. It could have been a really full on game. Players are still hanging around and a coach comes at you. We have tech benches in hockey. So tech benches are actually meant, meant, to, meant to monitor that, but sometimes they don't because they're inexperienced and that's okay. So when somebody comes full at you, and if I'm heightened because I've just managed a situation, that is not the best time for me to be talking to you. And it's not because it, it could actually exacerbate. So quite often what I'll say um, straight after the game is, hey, I've actually, I said, I really want to talk to you about this. I agree. That's important. It's something we need to discuss. I just need to go and sign all the cards and do what I need to do. I'll meet you at the back in, say, 10 minutes. Okay, so you need to assess the situation. I know personally, and so you've got to call yourself. If you have just managed two 16-year-olds going at each other and it's and it's escalated, but you finally got them playing, you are not in a good frame of mind then to have another heightened conversation, right? So that's when you could go, hey, I think that's a really great question. I've just got to go and sign. I've just got to go over to this and or I'm required on this court. I'll circle back in 10 minutes and we'll have that conversation at that point. So go away go grab a drink, calm, that person will continue to watch their child and then circle back and say, hey, what question did you have? Happy to discuss that now. So that can be of great, buying yourself some time so that you are in a calm space when you get to the question is actually really powerful. And a couple of times I've done that and I've got circled back to the coach and they've gone, oh, don't even worry about it. Like legitimately, oh, don't even worry about it. I'm not even worried about it now. So they were heightened by something that had just happened on the field. But by the time they'd calmed down and spoken to their players, by the time I got back to them, they didn't even care about it because it's in that moment that they actually care. So assess the moment. Is this somebody who is genuinely asking, hey, can I just what did you do there? Because they might legitimately, it could be grandma and she's got no idea what's going on and you can go through the code of conduct or whatever you need to go through with her about how you got to that thing. If it's heightened coach, because this is a ranking game or whatever it may be, I really think that's an important question. Just let me go. I've got to do this, this, and this. I'll circle back in about 10. And that's when you'll get a reasoned conversation. By that stage, they mightn't even want to speak to you, which diffuses any sort of conflict. Does that okay. like does that kind of help it? Hundred percent, and I think I, I told you I'd be writing notes as we kind of progress through tonight. So that's awesome. And I think, as you said, if you've had one heightened conversation, you don't want to then come off court and have another. So I think to the uh, court supervisors and referees in the room, I think that's a really important point uh, and managing your team as well. So if I know you've come off court and you've had that really heightened conversation maybe I need to come along and cover the court so that you can go and get that drink and you can have that breather. Um, and it's not you running away from anything. It's just, you actually do need some time to decompress. So I think that's a really important thing to note, managing our team and making sure then you can have that conversation when you do circle back, but you're so right. The amount of times it's like, Oh, forget it. I, I don't even remember what I was arguing about. That's, so exact, that's exactly right. And it's, it's actually really respectful. Like, so the language, if you listen to the language that I use, I'm just looking at faces and I've just seen Scott, Scott from Australia. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I haven't seen you in ages. It's nice to see you. Oh, you've got your rule. So you've got your Bible there in front of you. Good man. I love it. Um, I think it's really important about the language that I use. So if you listen to what I said was, I agree that's a really important question. Do you see what I mean? Straight away, I'm acknowledging that what you're saying is important. I might not think it is. I might think it's an absolute toss, right? But what I'm saying is, Oh, I agree. That's a really important question, but I need to go and do this. I'm going to circle back in about 10 minutes once I've done this and we can have a chat then. So they go, oh, yes, my question is important. That's great. You know, straight away, you're showing that respect. You mightn't want to, but that diffuses because they go, oh, okay. Well, she said my question is important, and, but then make sure you go back. That The follow-up is going to be absolutely key because if you leave them hanging, what will happen is at the end of that game, they're going to come and find you and they're not going to be happy. So make sure you circle back. And as I said, by that stage, they might just go, oh, look, I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> yeah. and, but I think it, 
that's really powerful too. And it's powerful for the child on the court because if you do circle back and they see their parent or their grandparent or their coach having a really positive interaction with an official, what does it say to them? It says, oh, wow, it's okay to be nice or cool to an official because my coach is or my dad is or my mum is or my grandparent is. It's actually setting the tone of the expected interaction between and start that from young. I always, I'm going to share a really daggy story, but you'll all love, I hope you love this because you're officials. Um, I was at my first national league back after having my daughter Ivy. So I had Ivy on the hip and Harper was about two and a half at that stage. And so um, I'd actually said, look, I can either come to this tournament. It was 2008. I'd had Ivy in 2007. I can come to the, to our national league, but the kids have to come because I'm still breastfeeding. So it's either Ivy starves <laughs> And I go to the tournament, I'm like, you allow my children to come. So my husband came and they stayed away, which was great because I actually got to sleep for a whole night. Actually, it was a great week because I slept a lot um, and I slept very well. But I was standing and I had Ivy on my hip and I had Harper by the hand and it was Queensland and WA were walking out onto the ground and I had the whole of the New South Wales hockey team in front of me and there were a number of Australian players who I knew in the team. So I had Ivy on the hip, Harper's on my hand and, you know, people were clapping the teams on and little Harper, my son goes, yay the umpires in front of the whole of the new south wales team and they all turned around and i said i am teaching them young like this and the, the girls thought it was golden they they went oh lynn that freaking hysterical they just thought it was but what a positive interaction for them and harper just thought he was chuffed because then the whole of the new south wales team thought he was great you know but just setting that tone right from the start and being able to have a bit of a joke about it Actually, it was great because when I umpired New South Wales next and we were walking out, they're all going, where's Harper? Is he cheering mum? I said, absolutely, he's bloody cheering me. He's not cheering you. You know, and we could have a bit of a yeah. joke about it. And it just diffused everything before you even went out onto the field. So it was played right from the start. They see you as a person. And I think that's one thing we well, players forget is that we're officials, we're human beings and we're volunteers. And quite often we've just dropped our children to somewhere or we've come off night shift or we've run from work or we're doing something, you know, it, this is, it's a big part of our lives, but it's not the only part of our lives. And so to see a humanness and to see that we do make mistakes and that we accept that and that we can have a bit of a joke and that we treat people with respect is really, really important that they understand that and and that that takes time to develop those relationships and rapport and I've been around a long time now and I'm very fortunate because I have a lot of those relationships with coaches and with players and with others and I'm you know with managers of teams and it actually just creates a really nice flow for the officials on the field so really work on developing your whole self um and, and some of the workshops through the Officiating Collective, um, some of the resources, we talk about um, being professional. I, I know that a lot of us, it's Saturday morning sport with, you know, 15-year-olds, but I, I don't think you should be rocking up in Australia. We call them stubbies and thongs, like which is a daggy pair of rugby shorts and thongs and a ripped shirt. I've seen officials do that. And the first thing it says to parents and kids is, I have no respect for myself, so therefore I have no respect for the sport. Um, think about how you do present yourself. I think it, it just neat and tidy, arrive on time, you know, be prepared. Just simple little things like that will actually create a much better attitude towards us as officials because people will see that you care and they will also see you as professional. And that's really important because that's half your battle won then. Because if... I've seen it before. Like I've seen dead, dead set. I've seen people out on hockey fields with no shoes and, and, and I just stand there going, Oh my God, what is happening? Cause the players don't show those people respect. And I probably wouldn't either because they show no respect to our sport. Yeah. Um, and ultimately we do what we do because we love our sport, right? I mean, that's yeah. why we're there. Yeah. So Absolutely. demonstrate that I think is really important. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really cool, and and I think a follow on from that too, and and someone's just messaged that as well. So, I love the idea of kind of setting the scene, particularly with kids, and trying to model that behaviour. You as an official, and knowing, like you said, you've had lots of years to kind of develop those relationships. Where's the line 
where it, where's the <laughs> no 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 how, I, yeah I we totally have, understand. how do we avoid that um and then also how do we actually start that because i i think a lot of the the interactions that we'll have particularly as on court officials the first reaction that we'll have with a kid is through conflict mm. and we won't yeah. have that experience off court so yeah yeah that will bounce um, and no 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 <laughs> touche, throw um i i think look when i'm out on a field um i a hockey field i have 22 players that i have to manage right so that's effectively when i'm out actively officiating I have 22 players that I have to manage and so what I will actually do is I will identify the players that I have really good rapport with and they're usually the leaders so I will work out you know um, I know when I umpire certain teams in Brisbane Div 1 um, that their captain is very good um, or their left inside is a strong player and I have a good rapport with those players so what I will actually do and this is how I develop my skill set right is I will identify the players who are leaders leaders and in tennis you will note that there will you know when kids sit in packs on the side of the court and you can always pick the kid that everyone's listening to that's the kid that's the kid that you want to develop rapport with right because because what that's going to do is if you pick the players that you're going to initially work on that development with everybody else will go oh so Blake gets on really well with Lynn. And if Blake gets on well with Lynn, that means that she can't be that bad. And I, well, in that case, you know, like I'm going to try and do the same thing. And it actually allows kids to lead too. So like I've, I've had situations on the hockey field where some players have been behaving really, really poorly. Um, but the people that I've developed rapport with will actually sit those, oh, sorry, it's a very strange thing, sit those people in their ass, right? They actually manage them for me. So, you know, like I, I'll have a, I have a young kid, there's a young kid in East and she's, she's an excellent player. She plays in the under 21 Australian team. She will play for Australia, but her attitude at the moment is just atrocious. I don't have to manage her. I don't have to manage her because Jill Springfield, their captain, who I have known for a number of years, is an experienced player. We agree to disagree at times, you know, but she has enough respect for me. When that young one goes to say something, Jill will say, do not speak to Lynn that way that is not or or, or you know what she, I've, Julie's gone got it Lynn you go sub off so I don't have to I don't have to do anything because I've developed enough rapport so I pick the players so you got to watch watch for your leaders and then ensure that you know who they are who their coaching staff are who their parents are and when they walk into the car park on Saturday morning at 7 a.m. and you're there waiting set up because we're professionals, you know, morning, Zach, great to see you. How are you going to this morning, Mr. and Mrs. Brown? That's all it is. And I go, oh, yeah, really good, Lynn. How are you? Yep, great. Yep, I'm going to need coffee today. It's cold. It's always cold in New Zealand, right? <laughs> it's cold, <laughs> isn't it? Okay. That's it. Then you walk away. But that has created a positive interaction and then you can grow that. The other thing that players respect is people, and I've said this before, people who know their stuff. If you do not know the rules of your game, if you do not enact the rules of the game, no matter what rapport you have with players, they will eat you alive on that that court. And I don't blame them. You need to know your stuff. You're not going to get it right all the time, but if you've got the rapport, they will accept it. They won't like it, but they accept it. I see more so in men's sport, the um, the blokey bloke um, name, first name basis stuff. So, um, and you can hear it on the television in rugby union and in rugby league. You hear it a lot, you know, oh, you know, good on you, Adam, or whatever it is. I'm really mindful as an official, you know, with the players that I have good rapport with, I may call them by their names, but on the field, no matter what the rapport is, those players know that I'm there to do a job and they know that if they make a poor tackle, I will send them off. And it doesn't matter how long or how well they've known me, they would expect me to send them off if they do the wrong thing or they would expect me to manage them. They would actually lose respect for me if I did not. So development of rapport is around those interpersonals, absolutely, but it's also demonstrating your knowledge of your sport and enacting it appropriately. 
those two things combined lead to really positive interactions and that doesn't have to be just with players it can be with coaches it can be with you know um, conditioning coaches it can be with masseuses it can be with whoever you need to need it to be so strategically pick your leaders create a positive interaction but ensure that you are managing your game the way that you need to otherwise no matter what work you do in that space they will they will not respect you yeah that's Fantastic. I love all of that. Thank you, Lynn. That's really cool. Like, can um, I just um, chip in for a sec, mate? Of course you can. Hi, Lynn. Um, I'm, my name's Chris. I'm the uh, general manager for Tennis Northern, but I've come, oh. I've come from a football background. So I've been a football referee for about 16 years. And, and yeah, um, and just so impressed with what you've been saying. And, and I think it's brilliant that Blake's got you along because I believe we learn more from other sports than we do from our own. So I'm envious of the cards and, and the tools that you have as a hockey umpire relative to what a football uh, referee yes. has. And I think, unfortunately, tennis is probably uh, our umpires and referees. We don't quite have the tools that, that both football and hockey have, and, mm -hmm. and maybe that's something we can change. Um, I've just got to reiterate, knowledge of the laws or the rules of the game is absolutely critical. And for all the tennis people, um, I have the ITF tennis rules on my phone and it's, it's always there, you know, it's such a key um, tool. Um, and the other thing you said, um, and it's something I used to, I still coach referees and teach them, you know, managing the game. And you said you manage the 22 players. In actual fact, I think you'll probably find that if you have another match official, you're managing them and you're managing the benches as well because you've got coaches and substitutes and most of them are not, backward and coming forward with comments if they don't agree with your decision. So, yeah, I just say how I'm really appreciative of this opportunity. Um, I'm going to join up the officiating collective. I think that's brilliant as well. And I want to share it, I hope you don't mind, with the football referees in New Zealand because I think there's some really valuable lessons here as well as you're reiterating the core pillars of what we do. Two things we do that work really well, um, we have a parent's code of conduct and Blake doesn't agree with everything on it. But essentially, it's we welcome and thank parents for coming along. Um, on the notice, it says, just as a reminder, as a, either a parent or a coach or a caregiver or a supporter or a coach, that you're here. And the moment these kids go on court, your role is a respectful spectator. And it says quite clearly, you are not here to umpire, keep score, coach, make line calls, or interfere with what happens on court. Now, I find this helps me. So the moment a parent comes to me and says, oh, so-and-so is cheating or they're getting the score wrong, I just point, and we have them up on big um, boards. I just say, oh, which one of those are you looking at? And I say, well, what does it say? Because you're not here to do that. I say, oh, I, I can send a referee along to keep an eye on it. And I think if you're really clear, and I know football do it as well, you know, they say that coaches are here to coach, the players are here to play, the referees are here to officiate. Come on, it's not the Premier League. Let the kids get on with it. And I think if you message clearly and beforehand what your code of conduct is for parents and players, it just saves you a lot of grief going forward because you can just keep referring back to that. So I think, think yeah, really no. love what you're doing. Yeah, Chris, I, look, I agree. And I'm seeing that more and more pop up around the place is the explicit code of conduct more so for junior. Senior sport, it doesn't roll. You know, if you're told... <laughs> Tell the coach that they're not that they'd I can imagine what the, the response would be. Um, but for junior sport, I, I actually don't have too much of an issue with that. I've seen one and it's it's really this is not the Olympics. Our players are not here, you know, and it's and our, our officials are volunteers. Um, and I think that's actually really empowering. I have little tolerance, I'm going to be very honest, um, for adults who show aggressive behaviours towards young people um, for a number of reasons, but um, I don't accept that behaviour. And it's, I, I think it's it's very important that we instil that from a young age and that we protect our young people from that type of behaviour because it's not appropriate and it's not actually okay. Um, I, I use the example of a, it was a national tournament, admittedly. So it was an under 15, an under 15 national tournament. And um, it was a game, New South Wales WA, a goal was scored and the umpires, the umpire awarded the goal and, um, that you know no one none of the kids whinged none of the kids said a thing but the coach who'd had video and had been able to slow down the video and you know replay it five frames said oi that wasn't a goal 
So then the coach got the captain to ask the question, right? And the two umpires did exactly what they had to do. They came together, they discussed it, and they, they went with that was a goal. Now, after the game, that coach walked out. So I had my reserve umpire, the two umpires. Now, I, I was not the umpire's coach on that game. Um, it was probably, on reflection, a very good thing that I wasn't the umpire's coach because I may have said something to that person that wasn't appropriate at the time. But he walked out and he, he shook the reserve umpire's hand. He said, good game. Shook the far field umpire's hand, good game. And he goes, but not you. Oh. Now, this man is six foot three and towered over a 16-year-old girl. And I tell you what, when that was brought to my attention, I saw red. Um, and I went to the tournament director and I said, that behaviour is not appropriate. What are, what are we going to do about it? And in the meantime, I and the tournament director's like, let me think, Lynn, let me think, because I went straight to eject him. He is not allowed back here tomorrow. Like, I went, rah. Um, and I rang a few people and I said, this person. And they go, oh, yeah, he's a blah, blah, blah. He does that every tournament. But no one had ever formalised it. Nobody had ever cautioned him. Nobody had ever code of conducted him. And I was so, so cranky about that because he'd been allowed to get away with that behaviour. So, of course, he did it. Because he'd done it at other tournaments and no one had told him that he couldn't do it, right? It's about setting those expectations that we discussed before. Well, guess what? At our tournament, we wrote a letter. We called him in for an official code of conduct meeting with the tournament director and the umpire's coach who was on that game and went, th went through and said, this is your first warning and only warning. And if that behaviour cap happens again, you will be ejected from this tournament for two days. Now, after that meeting, he walked outside and said, <laughs> I was talking to the umpire's coach, Charmaine, who's, you know, my colleague, but he, he knows through his own state. And um, he, he said, oh, I'm, I'm so upset that my, my integrity has been called into question. And Shah said to him, I'm just going to stop you there because I need to remind you that it was a very lucky thing that I was on your game and not Lynn. Because had Lynn been on your game, I think a very different discussion would have been had. And I can tell you right now, bloody would have. Uh, and I think the other thing about that was I said to Shah, when he said that to you, how did you respond? And she said, oh, I just told him that he needed to stop. And I said, well, I would have said, you know, that, you you know, when he said, oh, oh I can't believe my questions, my integrity has been called into question. I would have said, well, that's because you behaved without any. <laughs> that is why it is being questioned. So don't, don't go there. And Shah goes, oh, I know. I, I have a tendency just to go right enough kind of thing. And Shah's not that, that person and that's okay. And we manage that. You know what? He was golden for the rest of the tournament did not say boo to anyone else. And an actual fact was very respectful. So sometimes following your code of conduct and following your process can actually bring around a really positive outcome because guess what? Since that's happened, he's not stepped a toe out of line at any other tournament either because he knows that now there is an official record on the Hockey Australia system that we can pull and say pattern of behaviour. You're not welcome back. So I think that's really important. I think the other flip side of that for those of you who are managing junior umpires is that I obviously had three very distressed young women after that game and particularly one who he'd said, not you, to. And I had to then coach them through how to manage that situation and how to rebound from it. And, you know, it, it was really upset, upsetting for me because when we went through the video, they got the decision wrong. They did absolutely everything right, but they still got the decision wrong. So we went through the process and we went through the fact that an under-15 national tournament, we don't have a television or a video, video referral. I had to slow that video down to five frames slow to pick out that it didn't actually deflect off the attacker's stick. It hit a little divot in the turf and that's what created the deflection. Right, that, that's, how, that's, that's how quick it was. And that ball was going probably close to 100 kilometres per hour. That's how, that, so umpire, you have to make split decisions all the time.
right? So we went through the process, we got the decision incorrect. Ultimately, it didn't change the outcome of the game. And we weren't playing for a gold medal at the Olympics, right? And we talked through that process. And ultimately, what I said to that young woman is, I said, what's going to show your caliber as an official now is when I put you on your next game, how you are going to perform because I have absolute confidence in you. You just need to have confidence in yourself. And you know what? She went out the next day and umpired probably the best game that she'd umpired. And she was actually allocated to the gold medal match at the end of that tournament. She was she's such a great little umpire. She's now a doctor. She's the most amazing young woman um, and is still officiates for fun. Good on her, I say. She's got enough high pressure in her life. Um, but it, it just shows you that as officials, we have such responsibility to manage inappropriate behaviour and ensure that we do, but also to ensure that we put support mechanisms around our kids because that could have destroyed three umpires. Um, have we not managed that appropriately? So th things to think about, I suppose. Yeah. I've uh, just written a whole bunch of notes, particularly around that. And I, I will circle back because I do have a question on that. Yeah. But uh, Hamish put his hand up just before. So I think Hamish has a question for us. Sure. Yeah, as a, partly a comment that um, <clears throat> one of the things I make sure I do before every tournament is to totally reread the rule book. Um, so not just have it with me, but make sure I've gone over it um, again, just in case I think I know it, but I don't. And I quite often, uh, realised that I didn't quite know something or there's been a recent change come through that I'd missed or forgotten. Um, you partly answered the question I was going to raise with you in that last um, little bit there, but uh, in table tennis, we have um, the players uh, usually end up if the umpire the match after them mm -hmm. um, <coughs> on the thing. And so we have a lot of very inexperienced, especially junior umpires, and that's where we tend to have a number of issues emerge and <clears throat> totally agree with you, you know, when you find out that if they've been in a, in a conflict situation, walking them through with it afterwards um, and just sort of talking through and boosting their confidence is, is a critical thing to do. But I'm just wondering if you've got any, um, any similarity in tennis um, in terms of, it's very hard to get juniors interested in umpiring. Do you have... Yeah. Sort of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blake, you might you might have a strategy. Like I, I'm not sure if you do. Um I, I think in hockey, what what we do, we, we actually have um, strategies around talent IDing people from a pretty early age. Most of our um, umpires who have gone on to Olympics, Com Games, etc., have played at a high level. I'm going to be really honest with you. I played representative hockey all of my life up until my mid twenties, and it was in my mid twenties that I had to make a decision whether I was going to officiate or was whether I was I was never going to play for Australia. I represented my state, but I was never going to play for Australia. I wasn't that good, and I knew that. Um, but I. I, was, I had a pathways talk because I was talent ID'd um, where they said you could represent your country about it as an official. And for me, the desire to represent my country was really strong. And so I saw that as an opportunity as to how to move forward. But look, I didn't, I didn't start umpiring because I thought I want to be an umpire. Um, back in the day, and I think we need to go back to basics with our juniors, it was an expectation that we understood the rules of our game. So every club actually took their juniors, their junior players through an officiating program so that we understood our, our rules because you can't play if you don't understand your rules and you can't play at an elite level if you don't understand how to manipulate the rules, right? So, you know, it was an expectation that juniors understood the rules and every club was required to take their juniors through a program um, on the Gold Coast, which is where I'm from. Blake and I found out we had a connection there. Um, for us to actually play Division One hockey, we were required to sit the state a umpiring exam every year so that, that the Gold Coast set up a, a tone as an A grade if you want to play A grade you will understand the rules and if you don't sit the exam you don't get to play right so there was some pretty strong processes around that and I know in Brisbane um, for example I go out and I do pre-season rules talks with a lot of the division one women's teams so I'll go out and talk to them Alicia Newman um, who's just come back from the Olympics um, plays in Brisbane as well. And she actually plays for the Queensland um, Scorchers team. So she still plays at a national national league level. And so Alicia and I quite regularly do 
um, officiating talks and and whatnot. And every club actually has a junior officiating mentor. It's a requirement of the association. So they identify people and they run the programs to their clubs under our guidance because we have programs for them to run. But like as I said, like the reason at I was um, my first year out of under 15 representative hockey and my sister who was 18 months younger than me was playing at the under 15 state titles and Gold Coast Hockey Dead Set said to me, well, Lynn, you're going to be there watching DN anyway. Would you mind picking up a whistle and blowing it for us? Because we've got to send an umpire. And I went, yeah, no worries, because I'd done my officiating course as part of, you know, my program at juniors. And I felt confident enough to pick up a whistle and blow it because we were all required to umpire every weekend, predominantly as officials. And um, I was appointed to the Division Two grand final and talent ID at 16 because I showed potential, not because I said I wanted to be an umpire. And at 16, I didn't even know if I wanted to be an umpire, to be honest, because I was still playing high level representative school girls and club hockey. So, um, you know, I progressed through the state we have a very vigorous program in in Queensland and and through Australia and it's a long haul um and it's tough and it's competitive so that's why Australian umpires perform so well on the circuit because the the expectations of us both physically but also mentally and is is a long road it's not a it's not a short turnaround and they have the programs there to support it but as I said most of our officials are our our high level players and we show them an alternative pathway when their playing pathway may not be going the way that it wants to be or you know so yeah. I think you can be strategic around that like I know yeah and and like I mentioned to you when we were chatting earlier um I picked out one person who was you know come and do this instead of working at Macca's was a was kind of the, the tone I'd set for for someone for tennis but I I think you're absolutely right around we need to do more education with our players around the rules of tennis because we know, particularly for tennis, our coaches aren't necessarily doing it. Um, so it's going to fall back on us as officials to, to do those educations. Um, and I love the idea of, you know, if you want to represent your region or, or do something, you have to sit these tests or you have to know these rules because it is so important. And then maybe um, we'll have less conflict because people will understand the rules in the first place, but they'll also kind of develop as officials too. I think all that's and it really helps, cool. Like it, oh, sorry, I moved my mic. It helps you. Like when I captained the Gold Coast team um, and captained the South Coast school girls team and, and progressed through that way, knowing the rules as a captain was actually key because I could respectfully ask the officials to watch for things or could you please consider this? Could you please talk to your colleague? Could you watch this? And they knew who I was at that point in time and it actually helped our sport. And I asked respectfully, at no point did I go, oi, mate, you're being a dick, you know, watch this, whatever. Like, I, you know, you said, could I please request, you know, would you mind? I always used to speak like that. And so umpires, you know, as an umpire, you respond well to that. When a captain says, hey, Lynn, would you mind watching for that little push in the back. Yeah, no worries on it. I'll talk to my colleague. You know, like they might, nothing might be happening. You can just acknowledge it. That's fine too. Um, I like that. I like that, Julia. Perhaps parents should yeah, also yeah. be required to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's a, that's a given. That's a given, I think, Julia. I think that's sure. golden. Um, as I said, one way soundproof all, <laughs> I think is the best I've solution said, I've for I've said our upstairs parents. in the clubhouse with webcams. Remove them completely. Get them, get oh. them out of there. <laughs> um, oh, dear. I, I did just want to touch on something quickly, and then I have a, a different question. But sure. um, in, in that pre-reading, uh, everyone here needs to forgive me. I don't watch Rugby Union, but Nigel Owens. Oh, my so God. Watch him. There, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I YouTubed him. Yep. I clicked on the very first thing that came up, and it was 20 minutes of just golden officiating. Yep. It was incredible. Yep. And something that Chris said was there, there was a situation where it's something, something had happened and he looked at the player and said, you be the player, I'll be the umpire, or I'll be the referee, and we can continue this game. And it was just perfect. The, the player went, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I'll yeah. just go on my way. Yep. Unreal. Yep. And Nigel is this little man. Like it, dead set, he's a he's a very little man, and he's he's in amongst all these rugby players who are like six three and huge. But if you actually watch what he does, he creates space around himself to make himself look 
bigger. So, you know, like I saw somebody put put down in the chat before right at the start, and I'm sorry I ignored it. I'm going to come back to it. You know, what happens when you're five foot and everyone looks down at you? Um, you create space to make yourself look bigger. Um, and and that creates a sense of, of power around you. Um, so I think that's really, really important. Watch the Nigel Owen stuff. Like he he is so he's got a very wicked sense of humor and not everyone can pull that off. Like I know personally, I can't pull that off, but I think it's really important. It's as um, Chris said before, learning from other sports and watching what experts do in their space. Like Simon Toffel is just, he's this, like, he's this dude that walks in the room. He's about six, three and he's big, but he carries himself. Like he's a, he's a person, like if you were sitting down having a glass of wine and he walked into the room, you'd go, who's that? he's one you know like he has that aura about him um and and different people carry themselves differently there's a little um japanese umpire for hockey called chico and she is not even five foot right and she's been to two olympics she's absolutely amazing but if you watch what she does on the field she creates space around herself and she uses big hand movements so she actually makes herself bigger through her body movement. So strategically, she knows if she gets in amongst those players, she has lost all power and all credibility. So she doesn't. So strategically, she creates the space around her. She acts with respect and she's very clear around her expectations. And Nigel is excellent about being explicitly clear about his expectations. And that's what I love about Nigel. So if any of you Google Nigel Owens, like there's this one, yeah, it's 20, 20 minutes of golden Nigel Owens video clips. It's amazing. He actually does a really amazing um, podcast talk to about um, who he was as a person and how he had to overcome um, his battles because um, he has come out as being gay and, and how that actually affected his mental health and his ability to officiate. So listening to that, I found that absolutely inspirational um, in, in that particular sport. That was really as a massive thing at the time. Uh, and then what he did to progress was, was phenomenal. So I I look to other sports all the time to, to see what different people do and think, oh, could I add that to my tool bag? Um, could I, you know, I really like the way that they do this. I like the way that they spoke. Uh, you know, I like the way that they move. I like the, the way that they do this. And I think um, not, not that I have to do everything the way that other people do it. You have to be yourself, but it doesn't hurt. You know, when somebody says, you know, something that I go, oh, I really like that line. I'm going to try it. You know, and it might not work for me and I might never use it again because I might sound really silly. But at the same time, you don't know unless you give it a go. And so you can learn from others. And I think if you don't, then, you know, maybe you're not being the best official that you could be. I think that's definitely a takeaway for me tonight is tennis in particular. We're not alone. Like no. there are other sports that deal with all of the, although the rule is different, the uh, just the whole process is the same and, and we can, we can learn from everyone else as well. I think the other thing, um, Hamish, too, just I suppose going back to getting juniors in involved in sport and, Blake, I suppose it comes back to we're not alone. Like every sport deals with – I've watched my words. Every deal – every sport deal, deals with challenging players and their parents and supporters, I suppose, is, is the way I'll say it. But I think um, – in the context of being a team, I think team is really, really important. Um, as an official, as an umpire, you know, you walk out, like when you're at a hockey tournament, right, there are 15 umpires and you might have 15 teams all that have got like 17 or 18 people plus their coaching staff, plus their physios, plus their doctors, like their hordes and there's 15 of you. But I tell you what, as an official group, we moved as a pack. So we had our uniform. We sat together, we ate together, we went for runs together, we went to the gym together, we, we were our team, we ate breakfast together, we were never isolated and the players see that, like players watch that stuff and they know that you are part of something and that you're not isolated and you're not by yourself and I know like when I've worked in, um, as a teacher, I, I worked in some rural and remote centres in the early part of my career. And, you know, when I was up in Cairns, for example, Saturday mornings, I used to go down and help out with the junior umpires. And um, we'd have like, you know, you'd have to have fun days. So like we'd have a crazy hat day so that all of the umpires would just wear the craziest hats in the world. And like these kids are eight, and nine and ten and they're having a ball dressing up their hats. They'd get out there and they'd umpire and they were just having fun. And it was the whole, so you had all these crazy hats over the whole of Cairns hockey and everyone would go, oh, umpires having a crazy hat day. 
yes, we were. And we were having an absolute ball. And then after the games, we'd all come in and we'd talk about what had happened. And we had a rule of the week, right? So I'd email out all the junior umpires in the clubs. This is the rule of the week. So we're going to concentrate on this rule. And it was based on what I'd seen around what we needed to develop, right? And so I'd send them little clips and we'd have our theme. And they all thought it was so much fun. Like they they saw it as because they were part of a team. And and they and you know, and they were having fun and we got together and I sh- always shouted them an ice block at the end because it's always hot in cans, right? Um, you know, you do all those fun things and kids actually they want to be a part of it. Like so I used to have some of the players, like parents used to come and see me, see me and say, oh, my child wants to umpire now because they've seen the crazy hat down Saturday and the fact that they get an ice block. I said, yeah, it's pretty cool, hey. <laughs> so if you can come up with little strategies, and that was completely voluntary, you know, like I was working full-time and coaching an under-13 hockey team, playing Div 1 hockey and still did that because I'm passionate about it and it's fun. Little people are fun. I'm a secondary teacher, right? I'm used to dealing with big, smelly teenagers. Little eight and nine-year-olds are pretty cool and cruisy kids, so they were fun. Um, and if you can create that fun, supportive program for them within your own association you'll be surprised the buy-in you'll get and and the other part of that is you know I had about 15 or 20 umpires I also had 15 or 20 families that supported those kids so as other if anybody else tried to have a go at their child oh get ready because you were about to have 20 families come at you right and I think that's powerful as well because you create your own little family Um, and look some of my best friends still to this day are my umpiring family they are they're my officiating family um so you don't have to be a player to be part of a team and I know in tennis it's it is you know you need you know you're you're pretty individual but at the same time you've got a whole support network around you um and players do sit together you know I've been down to tennis tournaments I see the little you know the little people they all hang out together in between their games officials can do the same make it fun especially for young people it's good yeah I love that um, that's spun out so many questions that I just wrote down, but I am very mindful of time that we're running out of some. So oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, I'm gonna check my question before I do ask it because <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd like to get through at least two of them if we can. But sure. uh, one of them is around. I, I completely agree. We need to know our rules, and I think that that does come off for players as they know what they're doing and and so forth. So. Again, I'll double barrel you this and I'll, I'll put oh, both of my questions into this one for you. So one, one is how do we how do we develop our skills in a way that we although we're, we're very knowledgeable, we remain approachable and we don't come off uh, as either pushy or arrogant or kind of not the, the way we want to be. Yeah, That's part A. And then part B is what if there's a scenario where something happens and I don't know the answer? really good with my skill i'm really good with my rules and i know it inside out but there's just something that's happened and i don't know as of yep. right now i cannot come up with the answer what do i do <laughs> hard <laughs> okay so two two part and i just saw somebody put you know a lot of our juniors they umpire their own games um yep. so that's okay you know, you could actually, if you've got a junior associate, so I just, sorry, I just want to address that quickly because I think that's a really important point. I, I, you know, if, if junior umpire, if junior players are umpiring their own game, they need to know the rules, right? Because if they don't know the rules, they can't umpire their own game. Well, they can't umpire it fairly. So, you know, you might be running some pre-season um, spaces, you know, and like I, one of my, one of my colleague's son's is, is actually a very good tennis player in Queensland and he's working up through the ranks and Thalia talks to me about some of the stuff that the club that she's associated do, that they do you know at, at different times of the season they call all the juniors in and they do go through the rules with them because it's appropriate that they understand the rules because they're umpiring them right so you, just because somebody's playing and officiating I do, it doesn't mean I don't think you can't build their capacity as officials and in actual fact um, if you if you're coordinating that group and and every club is required to buy in because the association might mandate it or whatever it may be then you know that's that's another way to identify some possible up-and-coming officials too you know like if if some if kids are buying into that space you can go oh okay that kid shows an interest so I'm going to keep my eye on that child so don't think that you can't you know still do similar things just because it's players doing it you, you can absolutely still do a similar thing you just tweak it as you need to so in the context of not coming across as an arrogant person, <laughs> I think, um, or, or somebody that's not approachable. I think it's how we carry ourselves and it's how we interact with people. I'm going to be really honest with you. If I stood on the side of the court with my arms crossed like this 
and um, not and I'm not going to make eye contact with people and I'm not going to smile, I wouldn't come near me. You have to be mindful of how you carry yourself. I will, when I'm, I'm very conscious of my body language. Um, I'm a hands person and some people can find that really intimidating, right? So I will never close my body off when I'm walking around a tournament. And I know this sounds really daggy, but I smile all the time. I actually smile a lot. And people find, look, the average person, like if I make contact, I learned this very early. As a first year teacher, a deputy principal actually said to me, Lynn, you'd be stunned at the difference a smile can make in a child's day. Because that child might have come to your sport from a family where dad has just gotten home after a bender. He has punched a hole in the wall and mum has gotten those kids out of the house quick smart and she's put but taken them down to the local sport where they're about to play a game now that kid's coming to your sport heightened that's kids coming to your sport traumatized and if they walk in and the first thing that they see is an official going how are they going to react to that not well I wouldn't react to it well so think about your open body language think about actually making eye contact and smiling they don't smile back that's not your issue you can't control other people I always reflect on myself did I behave the best way that I could yes that's great some days I go oh that wasn't my best work (laughs) that's okay too we're human right but I think a smile open body language and the fact that all of the assertive communication that we spoke about right at the beginning of the night about showing respect about being calm about modeling the best behavior actually indicates to people that we are actually very prepared to engage with people but this is how we're going to engage with you and I would expect that you're going to engage with me in a similar manner and if you can't like if somebody comes at you and look I've had a coach yell at me do not punish my team for your incapability right that I was 17 I will never forget that comment it was my first division one Brisbane game that's what a coach said to me their team won 12 nil just quietly and I'm set I'm, I'm 47 now and I'll still remember that day very clearly that's how much of an impact it had on me so at that particular time, if I'd, if 47-year-old Lynn could go back to talk to 17-year-old Lynn, I would, say, I would say to myself, you were learning and that person had no right to speak to you that way and you can only manage your behaviour, not theirs. Because I personalised that, that I'd done, and I, I second-guessed myself and I talked myself out of that game. It was not my best game. But... I can't control the way others behave. I can only control myself. So think about your body language, thinking about making eye contact and smiling and think about all of that language discussion that we had before because that demonstrates that we can have those conversations. And I'm going to be really honest, when I go to hockey tournaments internationally now, um, Mark Hagar was the New Zealand coach up until pretty recently for the women's black sticks. Mark's an Aussie. Um, And Mark is one of the most challenging coaches internationally. Absolutely challenging. Like as an umpire's manager, you just hope, you hope Mark Hagar is not at your tournament, right? Because he'll challenge you. But Mark will always, like I'll go, hurry. And he goes, Lynn. They always give me a hug. He will always give me a hug. I'm happy to give him a hug, right? Because it demonstrates to all the other coaches, I'm happy to engage with you. Um, and I use a bit of cheek with Horry because I, ha- I can. You know, like one of my mist- one of my umpires did an umpire best game on one of Horry's games. He didn't come and see me after that game. Um, but the next day he came and found me at the tournament. I said, oh, where have you been? I've been waiting for you all day to come and have this conversation about this, 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 and this. And he goes, oh, well, at least, you know. I said, of course I know. I know the way you think. You know, like straight away he went, yeah. And I said, it's okay. This is what I've done. Oh, okay, Lynn. So they're not going to do it again. I said, well, I can't promise that. But I can promise you that my coaches are going to, my umpires are going to improve every game. I said, do you reckon our umpires have improved every game? And he goes, yeah, they have. And I said, well, what more can we ask for, hey? And he goes, yeah, not much. I said, great. Just, you can, some coaches I'll never have that rapport with, but the ones that I can, you model that behavior because people then buy into the fact that this umpire's manager is happy to have a respectful conversation with you, you know? And look, to some coaches, I just, I've said, we're just going to have to agree to disagree because I'm right. I've actually said that. I'm right. 
and your interpretation is incorrect. And if you continue to coach your players that way, they will continue to be penalised. So you need to make a decision and a choice. Nice. <laughs> right? And, and, and see my body language? At no point did I go, your players. Your players, you know? So think I, I'm very open and I use that calming hand stuff. And I, I don't raise my voice. I've been yelled at before and I've sat there and you don't want to know what my internal monologue is screaming at the person. But my actual monologue is, I don't think we're going to continue this discussion because it's going nowhere. And until you calm down, I'm actually not prepared to continue the conversation. I'll get up and leave. If they and follow that's okay me. Still, isn't it? Like, absolutely, it's, totally it's okay. okay. Absolutely, it's okay. And in actual fact, they're, 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 they're manager should be managing them. And sometimes their managers, the experienced ones, like I've heard managers go, just shut up to their coach, you know? But in situations where it could be the manager's first time and they're not sure what to do and it's experienced coach, they will, coaches will push you to see what they can get away with, right? That, of course they will. But you just, you just have to remain calm. I'll tell you, I've gone outside and gone into another room and bawled my eyes out, I hate being yelled at. I hate, I hate people trying to intimidate me. It's absolutely horrible, right? Get it out. Get the mascara back on. Sort yourself out. And you get out and you go, hey, how are you going? And you talk to people, you know? They, I will never let a coach know that they've intimidated me. Never. I will absolutely demonstrate that I'm human. I will absolutely accept when my umpires make mistakes. That's to come to me, not the umpires. And I clearly articulate that at the beginning of tournaments. My umpires will make mistakes. They are human, just as your players will. Because if your players were perfect, my umpires wouldn't need to blow their whistles. You know? So let's talk about establishing our patterns of practice. I talk about patterns of standards of behavior and, and, co and, our, and our standards of practice. I use those, I use that language very firmly. And we set expectations. And I'll tell you what, if a coach breaches that, I'll follow through as, as I need to. And they know that, right? They know that. They, and they know that I'll talk to them like this. I'm happy to sit down and have a coffee and a chat. You know, I've been at a field till 1am with bloody Mark Hagar. And I kept saying to him, Horry, I can't go back out on the field and change the decision. The decision's not going to change. <laughs> Why are we still talking about this? And I said, you're going to need to buy me a wine soon, mate. I'm going to fall asleep. You can, you can have those conversations. They don't want to let it go. They need to get to a point where they need to get to, and then you can go your separate ways. So I suppose think about your body language. Think about that language. Sit, think about establishing those clear, it's like Chris mentioned before, establishing those clear expectations about behaviour and ensuring you follow through. Um, look, sometimes you're just not going to know the answer to a rule or to a situation. and you have to, yes, go and make tea. That's important, Hamish. I would too. If you're hungry, go. Um, I'm getting hungry too. My husband just poked his head in before and he said, do you want dinner in mouth? And I'm like, don't talk to me yet. Um, you, you have to go with what you do know. So I would always say, don't make things up. I would say, this is my decision, but I, I would never, I suppose it depends on the age of the players, right? Okay, so if it's a Div 1 game, I'm going to make a decision and I'm going to stick to it because that's important that I stick to that decision. Now, if I get it wrong, I get it wrong and I would go and seek, I'd go and have a look to the rule book or I'd go and find Blake or I'd go and find Scott or I'd go and find somebody I could talk to and say, this is a situation that happened. This is what I did. And we talked that through. In actual fact, in Brisbane, we have a Division 1 um, WhatsApp group and every weekend at the end of the weekend, umpires will say, oh, this happened in my game today and this is what I blew, but I'm just not sure if it's right. And then the whole team go, oh, what happened here? Did you think about this? Where was your positioning? What about this? You know what I mean? Like it's, it, we've created a team where people can bounce ideas off each other because you're not expected to know all the rules. And even when you know all the rules, there are shades of grey in rules, right? So you've got to understand that there's shades of grey and it's going to depend on 
where you were positioned, um, you know, how many, there's a variety of things that can feed into your decision making. And quite often I'll look at the end decision and then I'll look, cause I have video, I'll look back at what led to the decision. And you can usually break down where the mistakes started to occur and it's through positioning or, you know, being in the wrong spot or, you know, misinterpretation or whatever it may be, but we can coach that for people. So with juniors, you make your decision, I think you can make your decision, but if you get the answer wrong, you, you need to accept that and say, you know what, I got it wrong. That's okay. Whatever it may be. I've been in a situation where I was, as a junior, I was on the field and I umpired and I blew the wrong decision. And then my, the, the um, more experienced umpire on the other side blew the whistle, came over and said, hey, Lynn, and talked me through it. And I changed my decision. And you know what? I got the decision right in the end. I changed my decision. It's okay to change your decision if you get the decision right in the end because I think players would respect you more for saying, hey, got that wrong, this is the correct decision rather than you might make a decision and go, Oop, I know I got that wrong, but I'm sticking to my guns because I don't want to lose face because what you're actually saying to those players is no matter what, I'm right and you're going to be wrong. So if you genuinely don't know the answer, you're going to have to, you're going to have to make a call, but make sure you follow through and find out the answer. Like, is that kind of what you wanted with that question? Amazing. Like yeah, you can't absolutely. just leave things hanging. The decision <laughs> needs to be made, right? But yeah. if you, you need to seek the information out so that if you did get it wrong, you don't do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Now I am very conscious of time. So I have one last thing. Uh, can you give everyone one challenge, one thing that they need to go and practice and or pick up yep. again or, or something? One, just one thing, one takeaway. Oh, wow. Okay. There's so many. Look, this is going to be an individual, like people are going to be, I think people will be reflecting on tonight's discussion and go, oh, I don't do that. Or I do do this. Or what about that? Or whatever, whatever it may be. But I think one of the, one of the main things that I, that I say to, especially, um, you know, my community-based officials is be proactive. So what I mean by proactive is if, you, if you've heard something tonight that you know doesn't happen with your association, don't walk away from this tonight and go, oh, well, that just doesn't happen in my association. How are you going to make it happen? How, pick one thing that you've heard tonight and say, we don't do this here how am I going to make it happen? And you might need to talk to other officials or you might need to talk to the coordinator of the officials or you might need to contact Blake and say, hey, this isn't working. This is one thing that we're not doing here. This is what I want to do. And think about the process to achieve it before your next competition starts. So, you know, it doesn't have to be done overnight. Um, it could be, I talk about fine. One thing that I always have is a mentor. Blake, I, I don't know, you know, how that rolls over in your part of the world, but even at 47, I have a mentor. Her name is Lynn Hill. And wh when I officiate, even to this day, I'll ring Hilly after a game and say, can I just debrief with you? There are a few things happened today. This is how I managed it. I was pretty happy, but I think I could have done this differently. I'm an ex-international umpire who is umpiring Div 1 hockey in Brisbane, who still wants to improve their performance because I don't think you can ever stop improving. It may not be around you individually with your decision-making. It could be, hey, our table's in a small room out the back and we are becoming isolated and it's putting parents in a position of power. Where am I going to move the table to? Who am I going to have that conversation with? And how am I going to make sure that happens for our next competition? One thing from tonight, and make sure it's actioned. And Blake, if I can throw it out there, flick Blake an email when it's happened. Say, this is the one thing I identified. This is what I did. And this is how it's working. And I think that. that would be actually really powerful for everyone to try and do one thing. Absolutely. And then I'll feed that back to you as well, for sure. <laughs> so that we know exactly what, uh, yeah, what everyone's yeah. takeaway is. I think Good. everyone will take something different. So I think that's really cool. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much, Lynn. I've kept you for too long, but uh, the, the messages coming in already are saying how fantastic this is. So um, I cannot thank you enough for, for freeing up the time for this. And I will definitely be coming to you. And I'm sure everyone here will get to see you again. I know, Sorry. definitely.
thank yeah, you thank you so thank much you for having me and everyone thank you for giving up your friday night <laughs> i hope everyone's had a few drinks you might need it after that <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay everyone fantastic. i'm gonna go get a beer i hope you get a wine <laughs> i will thank be. you so much lynn that's really fantastic <laughs> thanks everyone <laughs> bye that's awesome cheers <laughs>